Thank you very much, all of you. Um, there's nothing much left to say, really. Uh, everybody so far has explained the business of dyslexia, the problems of achievement or failure. Um, first of all, is my mic working when I move over here? So yeah. I don't have to be behind the box. I've been pretty close to being in a box several times. <laughs> um, my story isn't all that different from Paul's. And my situation was that I w went to school. My, garage, my father had a wee garage on the way to Dumbarton. If you look at the uh, Glasgow, you can turn left or come right. Helensborough or Loch Lomond, that's where our garage is. And the wee bungalow that I was born in uh, is just beside it. I went to school, Dumbarton Academy. And I was a complete failure. A complete failure. In those days, and there's some schools that just have them and some of them they've done away with, the 11 plus. Is the 11 plus running quite a lot over here or no, not? Not No, it's gone. Down south it's still there, but of course they're not too bright down south. <laughs> um, I failed my 11 plus twice. That meant I was not back at the age of 11 to nine, if you think of it in those terms. And when I got to having to finally get it, that you could, in those days you got a knee, and if you got a knee, you got Latin and French. If you got a B, you just got French. If you get woodwork, you've got a C, and if you get a D, you get woodwork and, and metalwork. I got both of them. <laughs> I left at school, school at 15 with absolutely no education and I couldn't have got out of it fast enough. Something usually happens to most all of us. In my case, my grandfather was a gamekeeper, my father was a good shot, and I was given a shotgun to try. It wasn't mine, I lent it. And for some reason, my hand-eye coordination was good. And I practiced at home a wee bit on clay targets. But I went to my very first competition here in Scotland. And it's all ages. It's not just young people at a certain age. It's of all ages. And I won my very first competition. A very good reason for it. It was a New Year's Day. <laughs> All the mature ones were pissed. <laughs> so I won. I went back three more years and won it every year for the same reason. But it gave me confidence. For the first time in my life, I felt proud. The trophy I won was about this big. It took me a long time in motor racing to get another trophy that big. So I kept on my shooting until I was 23 years of age. I shot for Scotland to begin with and kept shooting for Scotland, but I shot for Great Britain as well. I went all around the world shooting for Great Britain. Now, it wasn't my first sport, funnily enough. It was football. Now, for some reason, some of these people in the Scottish football world never picked me up. <laughs> really upset about it. Um, I played for my school and I played for my county because it was the only thing I was any good at at school was sport. Now, a great number of people who have achieved in the life of having dyslexia have gone on to sport. You've just seen one who plays down south nowadays, more money there. Um, but in my particular case, I wasn't good enough to play for Dumbarton at Boghead. I wouldn't have been good enough for Celtic or Rangers, uh, but my shooting I was. So going round the world, winning the European Mediterranean Championship, Scotland, England, and the Welsh, and the English I won, and I won a few more. At 23 years of age, I got married to Helen. We've been married now for 54 years. And when we got married, I couldn't afford shooting, which was an amateur sport, or got married. 
Now, I made a fatal mistake. I got married instead of shooting. <laughs> I've been working for all these years and I've had three world championships and I'm still behind in the money with the girls. <laughs> Excuse me, correction, one girl. <laughs> I'm a racing driver. It's only the football players that get birds. Um, so, so there I was. Now, I started racing and very quickly I got success. I'm well coordinated, hand-eye coordination was good. Shooting taught me that. One thing that I did learn from shooting was mind management. Not to get overexcited, not to get down. Not to get happy when you won, because the next one you might not win. To try and mind manage when you're shooting a clay target. If you miss it early on, you never get it back. If I made a slight error of judgment driving a racing car, I could make it up in the other 15 corners. If Jim and his business like makes a wee bit of a mistake somewhere or other, the chances are he can make it back next month or next year. But in shooting, you can't. You don't get it back. It can only be 99 out of 100 from that point on. And that taught me in motor racing not to get excited. Emotion's a very dangerous thing. Either when you get down or even when you get up. If you get up and you're king of the castle, you're only king of the castle for a very short time. If you get down too far, you don't have the energy to go back up. Now, I was lucky that sport did that for me. In later life, it's worked in business. Because I've made more money out of business than I've made out of sport, in fact. My problems at school were multiplied. And when you're in school, in my class were 54 people in the one class. And when that teacher, Miss Shaw, her name was, I'll never forget it, told me to come up and read from an essay that I couldn't see. I was up there and I was looking at a jungle of words. I had absolutely nothing that I could pick up. After a wee while, she's looking at me and she's upset. She says, carry on. I couldn't do it. She then says, because I can't carry on. And by this time, you're in the front row and some of you in the middle of the row are starting to giggle and some of you are coughing and some of you are doing whatever you have to diminish what I've just failed to do. So I have to walk back. Before I walk back into my own seat with everybody else really taking the mickey, she says, that's a good example. He's dumb, he's stupid and he's thick. Don't you be like that. Now that lasts a long time in a wee boy's head. And from that point on, I had an inferiority complex. You may be surprised to hear. Because I still couldn't read and write. When I was 43 years of age, Mark, our youngest son, younger son, we put him in a very fancy school in Switzerland. I had to leave the UK the Labour government at that time was charging me 93% tax. And racing drivers were getting killed a lot at that time. So I moved to Switzerland. I've sent my sons to probably the second most expensive school in the world. Four, four weeks later, I get a call from the headmaster saying, we'd like you to get your son out of school. Oh, why's that? Oh, he can't keep up with the rest of the class. And it's spoiling the whole pattern. So I said, I can't do that. I'm just paying you a hideous amount of money and you've had it in advance and I've not taken it back. You're going to have to do it. He said, in one condition, you have him assessed. I took him to London to be assessed. And this professor in London turned around and said, after only 15 minutes, came out and said, no, there's no problem. Your son's only dyslexic. I didn't know what dyslexic meant. I didn't know the word. I'd never heard it before. And I said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, but he'll do all right. I've done all right in life, and I'm sure he will be too. He said, have you ever been assessed? I said, no, I don't mean, what do you mean assessed? He said, do you have 10 minutes? 
I went into a room, a darkened room. Ten minutes later, I walked out. I was told I was dyslexic. For the first time in my life, I suddenly understood that all that humiliation, all that abuse, there was a reason for it. I wasn't dumb, I wasn't thick. Helen never knew I couldn't read or write when I was 43 years of age. I was married when I was 23. I faked it. Dyslexics can fake very well. There's a false way that you can make things happen. I still to this day can't read properly. You were saying that you give all these kids iPhones and and iPads. I cannot use an iPhone or an iPad because I can't find my name on a keyboard. It's a jungle. I can't read or write correctly to this day and I can't spell. Now, I didn't have the benefit that most of you young people in this room have for people who understand that they've got dyslexia or another form of learning. I call it a disability. Some people say, oh, don't call it that. It's a disability for me. It certainly was for me. So therefore, what do we do about it? We've got to change the educational system. Now, Jim here is doing something different. And he's got access to the First Minister as I have. But when the previous Alex Salmon was in, the first man um, really to understand it properly for me. And I asked to speak to the, there was at that time eight teacher training colleges in Scotland. I asked to speak to the deans. It's not the chancellor, it's not anybody else, but the deans of the universities who decide which of the teacher training colleges get what they've got to do. And I wanted to be sure that the future population, all these younger ones on this side, for example, were going to get proper education. And to do that, the teachers had to know what dyslexia or learning difficulties were. So if they had to do that correctly, it would have to be a teacher training college. So we only had seven at that time. Now we've got eight, I think. And if we got every new teacher to be taught how to have the skills of early recognition of a young boy or girl and then knew what to do with them and passed them on correctly to the right people, it would stop all of that aggravation and all of that pain and all of that suffering. And in some cases, it has a terrible effect on people. Jack McConnell gave us £1.4 million pounds to Dyslexia Scotland to put into the University of Aberdeen to put a chair for learning disabilities, which has worked well. All of that is still better in Scotland, even though it's not yet right. It's better in Scotland than it is in almost any other country in the world. They certainly don't have it in England. And I spent God knows how many hours at Westminster, trying to speak to ministers of education and all of the people who I can can get access to. But can I get them to do something? Absolutely not. They are not as advanced in England as they are in Scotland. That's true of the rest of the world. There's cells very good at it and then the rest of the stuff are not being done correctly at all. So in my particular case... Paul, my elder son, is also dyslexic. Not as extreme. He went to university in America. He wouldn't have gone in to Oxford or Cambridge if he was thinking of living in England. But he got into Duke University in America because they understood learning disabilities. And Paul got in there and graduated in Duke. It's one of the four leading universities in all of the United States. And they did him a hell of a lot of good. Mark, on the other hand, had to go to a special school. But it gave him confidence that he was amongst other people who had the problem. Now he makes films. Great filmmaker. He did that little job up there you just saw. He's just finished making a film called The Last Man on the Moon. 
It's been, it's been given the best documentary of the year. It's gone all around the world. It's in general release in the United Kingdom, but also in America, because it's been done so very well. And I don't know how many people in this room, if I said to you, who was the first man on the moon? Hands up who you know who the first man on the moon is. Look at that. God, you're clever. <laughs> okay, the same clever folk. Who was the last man on the moon? What was his name? Come on, you're dumb, all of you. <laughs> Did somebody say a name? No? Neil Armstrong was the first. The last man on the moon was a man called Gene Sherman. Nobody knows who Gene Sherman is. And there's only been 12 men that's ever walked on the moon. And he, of course, is one of them. And Mark made the movie about the last man on the moon. All the clever folk would have gone for the first man on the moon. <laughs> and it might not have been as good a story. So that's the difference between a dyslexic or other forms of learning disability, as I call them. But Mark has, will probably be more successful than Paul at the end because... <laughs> of his way of working, whether it's the arts or whether it's sport, in my case. Lewis Hamilton, you mentioned, quite bright, not very scholastically bright, <laughs> but a damn good driver because he's tried harder. The clever folk do not try as hard as the folk who have got a problem. And you never give up. You know, I, one of the best races I've ever had in my whole career was the Italian Grand Prix when I had a puncture in the car on the third lap. I had to come in. In those days, they didn't change wheels and tires in 4.2 seconds or 3.9 seconds. It took about an hour and a half in my, <laughs> in, my, in my mind. So I started at the back, way back, because all the others had gone round. I finished up fourth. I drove the best race of my life, actually. And I only finished fourth, but I came from way back because you don't give up. No wonder you think, you know, if you're behind and whatever it may be, you can never give up. Now, the people who have the problem and they're not being held as much in a good positive way in other places like they are here in Scotland, because of Dyslexia Scotland reaching out, because we've got a small government instead of a big government, we get things done. So a lot of you are very lucky in this respect. And it doesn't seem so at the moment, but you'll be appreciating it later. If you leave school and you can't read or write correctly, such as me, you hang out with the wrong people. You hang out with the other dummies, so to speak, that the, that the teachers called them. I did that. When I was 13, 14 years of age, I was hanging out with the wrong people. That broken nose there didn't come from a Formula One accident in Monte Carlo. It came up a close in Dumbarton <laughs> in a wee, well, it started off in a wee billiard room, which was only a Nissan hut. I was hanging out with the wrong people. When I left there one night, I got out the close to go to the bus stop and five of them, who I'd never seen before in my life, but must have been in the, boy, in the, the billiard room, kicked to living daylights. Corner, a, a broken nose, collarbone and three ribs. I was in the wrong place with the wrong people. So never get into that situation. And I'm now talking about you young ones up there. Never do that. Try and get to people who are going to respect you because the chances are you're going to be very good at it. All the people that I went to school with haven't done as well as me. 54 of them in that one class haven't done too well by comparison. I was lucky I found sport. But I don't do sport now. I do business. Now, I may not have made as much money as, as this fella down here. 
but be bloody careful. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do, how do you change all of that? You change it with the educational authorities, and that's one of the biggest things Dyslexia Scotland does and has done. We've got access to the Minister of Education. We've got access to the First Minister. And because there's an awful lot of financial cuts being made right now here because of the price of oil going down, a whole lot of things, we currently are getting the same amount as we got before that recession of the, the oil business took place. Because we've been able to go and see the, the First Minister and say, look, this is a bigger problem than you think. If, for example, some of you get out of school, whether it's at 15 or whether even you manage to get to university but don't do very well, the chances are you go out there and you might not get a job. Now, if you can't read or write, there's a very good chance you're not going to get a job in the traditional way. Jackie Stewart cannot fill in a driving license paper. I can't do it. It's just a jungle. But if you are doing, and they pass a paper to you, and it's usually at least two pages of a job application form, if you can't do that, you might not get the job. If you don't get the job, of course you get unemployment <coughs> benefit. You know what? Crime pays better than unemployment <laughs> benefit. In Scotland, we've got, what is it, nine prisons now? Eight or nine prisons. And they're big numbers of people. In Sockton Prison in Edinburgh, it's something like 900 people. They're in prison, most of them. About 70% of the prison population of Scotland cannot read or write. Almost exclusively, they're dyslexic or some other form of learning disability. Now, when you're that depressed that you have to go to crime... You're probably on drugs and you're probably drinking or on anything else that you can get. Glue, sniffing glue. That's what happens. And your whole life goes down. So the challenge for Scotland is to be the best. The best in education, even for us, who are not very bright by a lot of people's minds. Totally wrong. Leonardo da Vinci was dyslexic. Einstein was dyslexic, Churchill was dyslexic, Muhammad Ali, dyslexic, Steve Redgrave, the rower, five Olympic Games, five gold medals, dyslexic. I could give you a whole lineup of really successful people who have been dyslexic because they try harder, they've got a better imagination like my son Mark has. So none of you and the younger ones up here should ever give up. And if you are suffering from dyslexia or any other form of learning problems, really don't worry about it. Nowadays, you'll get a better chance of getting a lift as long as you come out the closet. But we are now going to prisons, Kathy and I, and we're asking them to put their hand up if they cannot read or write. Don't want to put their hand up. And then suddenly I say, I can't read or write. And I go into a little fuller and suddenly you see one hand up. Then you see another hand up. And you find out that about 70% of them can't read or write. But they don't want to admit it. Because they're embarrassed. Now can you imagine, I went all the way with Helen. From, her being, from, from me being 23 years of age until I was 43 years of age. Before I admitted that I couldn't read or write. I was ashamed of myself. I had no self-esteem. Only sport gave me that. Now that applies to anything. You know, you talk about bankers, for example. Big time bankers are brilliant. Not necessarily. Some of them have got common sense. And there's a banker in America called Charles Schwab. And he was trying to be a banker and he saw everybody going for the millions. Well, we've got to get this and we've got to get that. If we go to Jim, we're talking millions, right? Charles Schwab decided he would go to people 
who had a hundred dollars, 60 pounds. So he built a bank all of over America for small investors. The clever folk weren't that interested. When the crash came, Charles Schwab was on top because the ones with the big money suddenly lost all their money with the recession. So therefore, he thought out of the box, thought totally differently. And everything I do in my life is totally out of the traditional box. And I'm speaking to chairmen and CEOs and prime ministers. In Malaysia, I got them to start a programme on the, on the way that Dyslexia Scotland was running it. Now, they work quickly. Very bright parliamentary selection <coughs> in Singapore. If somebody becomes a member of parliament in Singapore, they give... The government gave, let's say it was Jim here. If you say that you're earning, let's call it, I know this is small for you, <laughs> let, let's say £500,000 a year. <laughs> if, you, if they thought you would be good as a government minister, they will give you £550,000 a year. That's a fact. Now, they're a very rich country, but they've managed it really well. They've now got 65 schools in Singapore all fully equipped for children with learning disabilities. Small country, just like us, same population as us, and yet they've done that. Now, they're going to have clever folk come out of there and that country will remain a success because of that. So whatever you do, doesn't matter what you do, the one thing I've learned is you've got to take the extra step. You think you've done it all right, but you've just got to get a little bit of improvement out of it. Now, I'm going to show you another DVD in a minute. This was made by Paul, my first son, and he likes music. He grew up, one of my best friends was George Harrison, and some of the younger ones won't know who that is, but he's a Beatle, and he's not a bad guitarist. So Paul got taught to play the guitar by one of the Beatles, George Harrison. He decided... When I was 70 years of age, I don't know who thought that one up, but I'm much younger than that. Um, but it, when I was 70 years of age, I didn't need another pair of cufflinks and I certainly didn't need another watch. He decided to write a song for me. He wrote the lyrics, the words, and he wrote the music. And he then got Mark to videotape him singing this song. And when I found out he was going to sing it, oh, I thought, my God, I've heard him in the bathroom. It's terrible. <laughs> so he did all of this. He put it together. And then he presented it to me in London. They were giving me a surprise birthday party. I didn't know about it, and I didn't know about the movie. But he wasn't showing the movie. He announced, he stood up and said, listen, everybody, and, and they've got royal family members there. I've got Mr. Ford from America, the Rothschilds, all the fancy folk around the world who I know all came to my 70th birthday. And Paul said, this is my birthday present for my father. I'm going to sing. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and you're going to see him singing here. And just listen for it. When... The chorus comes up. The chorus is, if you fly with the crows, crows are vermin. If you fly with the crows, you're liable to be shot at. Up a close, billiard room, Dumbarton. Billiard rooms are a lot better now, but then I went. <laughs> if you soar with the eagles, like our golden eagle, you're above shot. Shot can't reach you. So if you hang out with the right people, if you choose, and I'm talking to all you young ones now, if you really choose the right people to hang out with, they're not going to get you into trouble. It's the other ones that will get you into trouble. And some of them are in here now. <laughs> so therefore, it's called Fly Free. And if you're listening up in that box up there, I'll step aside and this is the, this is the wee song. And listen to all the words. Paul and Mark did a pretty good job, right? But the real addition to this is that when he finished all of that, to begin with, he was just doing it himself. And it's like all of us, 
this front, whatever age, he thought it's good that maybe we should add something. Maybe we should just take the extra step. And that extra step was going to a pal. Can't remember his name right now. <laughs> oh yeah, Eric Clapton. <laughs> now for Eric Clapton to come and do a wee thing like that, he did it because we were all friends. But he's probably the best guitar player in the world. And that made the difference to that little DVD. So you can always take the extra step. And even if I'm driving in the past or whether I'm doing business now in the front, I need to take the extra step. Because if I don't, everybody else is lined up beside me. And I'm just one of them. So all of you young ones who are going to beat up all of us old ones, <laughs> uh, it, you'll probably do it if you take the extra step. Do it a wee bit differently from anybody else. And you know what? If you are dyslexic, the chances are you are going to see another way of doing it that the so-called clever folk don't see it. Branson, who created Virgin Air all over the world, in music, in insurance, in all sorts of other derivatives, totally dyslexic. He cannot read or write. But he knows how to pick good people and put good people into good positions, and therefore they succeed. So all of you can really hit the top. Scotland's a wee country, but we've produced more really successful people per head of population than I think any other country in the world. And for all of you young ones who are here, you are that future. And if your schools do better for you, and if the Scottish government do better for you in regards to getting more and more schools being properly cared for, for those who have got learning problems, you'll be even better, and so will this country be even better for a longer term. Well done to the Football Association for, and I mean, it's not often I get as good a place to speak as this, um, and really for all that you're doing for us. It's another sport, and that's why dyslexia is so close to where you are. There'll be a lot more dyslexics associated with what you're doing than will be in any illness, even cancer. There'll be more people troubling in that respect so thank you for that Jim thanks for coming along thank you for you Paul for your uh... it's a pity you didn't have more energy Paul <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you very much <laughs>